Hello modelers and welcome back to another episode of The Model Guy and in this episode I'm going to be doing a build review of MiniArt's new P47 Thunderbolt, the basic edition. Now the P47 from MiniArt is one of their first complex aircraft kits they've done and I'll start out on a positive note because generally the kit is very well done. You have a lot of nice detail, the fit's generally pretty good, but there are a few gutchu areas that you have to look out for. Now that doesn't necessarily make it a bad kit because I'm going to give you a heads up on a few things here that may help you out in the long run. One of the notable things when you're assembling the kit is these T-bars in the back. They don't 100% fit, but if you're test fitting like you should when you're building, that's not really going to set you back too much. One interesting approach that MiniArt took with their basic P47 kit is they've given you some molded in seat belts and a lap belt that goes across as a separate piece. Now this is a little bit interesting because it looks kind of bulky, but with a little bit of paint and given the depth of the cockpit, it actually looks pretty good. And for an out of the box build, this kit pretty much has everything it, you need. The cockpit detail is really nice. You have some more hoses and wiring than the Tamiya kit or the Academy kit. And if you take some time here with detail painting, you can really make it pop. One of the strengths that MiniArt has always had as a company is their detail is always on point and very well done. So it should be no surprise that that detail carries over very well into their aircraft lineup. Now, unfortunately, you can tell that this is one of the first complicated aircraft that MiniArt has designed because there's a few areas that need some work to fit properly. When you're assembling the cockpit tub, you do have to open up the slots a little bit to get the sidewalls to seat in properly and to get the rear bulkhead to fit properly. But if you're test fitting and you clean up these areas a little bit more, you shouldn't have any problems. Just know that you're gonna have to do a little bit of work here to get a nice clean fit. Before closing up the fuselage, there are a few things you need to make sure you drop into place because you won't be able to do it once you glue them. The first is the supercharger housing and the shielding behind it and the wheel well. Initially, I thought that was so you wouldn't bust the tail wheel off during painting and assembly, but then there's a few other things you do install early, and it kind of had me scratching my head. The first one being the aerial mast behind the canopy, and this goes in with a sort of hook and anchor style, so you can't put it in late without some work. So if you're going to install that at the end of the build, I would recommend just cutting it off. And the second is installing the gun barrels this early. Miniart chose to... Oh shit. Miniart chose to design the gun barrels and backing plate all as one piece. And while this does drop into place, it makes a bigger problem downstream because you can't clean up the leading edge of the wing with the barrels in place. So if, when I build this kit again, and I definitely will, what I'll do is install that backing plate, but cut the barrels off and use them to measure some brass tubes. That way I can install them after the wing cleanup. One of the interesting things about this mini art kit is that it's almost a pendulum that swings both ways. For every part that you kind of have to fiddle with to get to fit properly, there's another part that drops in seamlessly. One of those being the cowling in front of the windscreen, which eliminates any seam cleanups from the fuselage half, and the second being the bottom of the wings. Those extra panels drop into place with no cleanup. The engine area is no different. The pushrod tubes have been molded in an interesting way with the gates being between the tubes. This makes it a little bit difficult to remove it without damaging. Another area that ended up being more difficult than it needed to be was the intake on the lower part of the cowling. This was made up of four pieces and took quite a bit of work to get to line up nicely before installation. Once you're through the hurdle of that intake assembly, you're actually rewarded with a very nice out of the box R2800 engine. I simply used some lead wire to replicate the ignition wires. This is definitely one of the high water marks of the mini art kit because there's a lot of great detail here that you won't need to replace with a resin engine. I know mini art is also releasing an advanced version of this kit which will actually let you have all the piping and all the cool reservoirs and stuff that you normally don't see in a model kit. But swinging back that pendulum, that means we have to have a low water mark of the kit, and that's definitely the cowling assembly. The way MiniArt designed this, I imagine, is so when you have the advanced kit, you can just have the panels off and have them set aside. But the problem is getting them to align and sit properly in place turns into be quite the challenge. And I think one way MiniArt could have improved this kit 
is to simply mold a single piece cowling like Tamiya did. And that is really my only big criticism of this kit. By spending just a few hours detailing and painting this engine with a nice wash, you can really make it the jewel of the kit. Now here's where things start to get complicated and have you scratching your head. And that is fitting the panels over the engine. You have a nice base ring and a base plate in the back, that bulkhead, but there's no real positive locks to putting things in place. The slot that that tab goes into at the bottom of the engine is oversized so there's a lot of slop in here and that's not great when you need something to line up precisely. Even looking at the back here, there's nowhere for that bulkhead to lock into. So it takes a lot of time here to get things lined up before committing to glue. Before moving on to the other panels, I made sure that bulkhead was sitting on top of the bottom panel in the rear and sitting as centered and squared as possible. Now, the bottom slot is super loose and the side panel slots are super tight. So I found it was easier to remove the tabs from the panels and then just line them up by eye the best as possible because when they locked into the tabs, they offset everything. Another approach to assembly might have been to put the side panels on first, but I think that might have made it more complicated because the bottom panel wouldn't fit in that case. Like I said, this part is the biggest criticism I have of the kit, so just be ready to work here and expect this. But with a lot of test fitting, you can have a nice cowling before you commit to paint, but it's not a drop fit. I know that there will be some modelers who will stay away from this kit because it doesn't have that Tamiya-esque fit, but for me, the detail mini art included more than offset this. Another speed bump to watch out for on this kit is this mold line right here. Now, a couple passes with an 800 grit sanding sponge, and you have that gone. You just have to be careful not to remove the detail on that access panel that that line goes right through. Once you have that mold line polished out, simply grab your favorite scribing tape and scriber and simply add in the new panel line. This isn't a very difficult line to scribe, and the easiest way to do it is just a few light passes until you start getting the line. For my favorite scribing tool, I copied the one and only scale scriber and used a needle with a vise. Another part of the mini art kit that I really liked is that the elevators are separate from the horizontal stabilizer and you can put them in the drooped position, which is where they would normally sit when the aircraft was on the ground. Those are the small details and kits that I really like. One of the last speed bumps in the kit is getting the wing roots to fit properly. I used some perfect plastic putty to fill in the gaps and then wiped away the excess with a wet Q-tip. The nice thing about a water-based putty is you don't lose any detail when you're cleaning things up. On the flip side of that though is if you need to rescribe panel lines or add in rivets, water-based putty is not the answer because it just tears out. Now with the bodywork complete and a second round of primer down on the model, it was time to move into paint. And for this model I decided to do the colors of the 56 fighter group because they had the variety of entering the European theater flying P-47Cs and flying them right through until the end of the war. The 56 fighter group was the first fighter squadron to escort US bombers on raids deep into Germany. And although they started out at a little bit of a disadvantage with almost 18 pilots being killed in training alone before shipping out, they quickly got used to combat over the European theater and started to make a name for themselves. And when you get a group of young pilots making a name for themselves, they tend to start doing some unique things with their aircraft. And that's what leads to the paint on this model. The 56 fighter group wanted to stand out amongst other aircraft in the sky. So they used the stocks of RAF paints and some other paints they had on hand to give their aircraft some unique looks. And this specific P-47 is Colonel David Schilling's and was painted with RAF day scheme colors. I'm a big fan of the Mr. Color take on the RAF dark green, ocean gray, and light sea gray because they're a little more washed out. One of the biggest challenges of painting this kit is that that aircraft were painted in the field and you can see in the reference photos the paint was very splotchy and not even. So when you're trying to do this in scale it's very hard to not have the paint come across looking like you don't know how to work an airbrush. 
So the big challenge is trying to find a rough look to the paint that still works in scale. So you have to think of how small a person is in 1 48th that would have been laying down these squiggles, as I'll call them. It's definitely a very hard balance to find and meant a lot of touch-ups were needed. I've always wanted to do the RAF markings on a P-47 because they make the aircraft look even more aggressive. If you're looking for more information on the 56 fighter group or more information on the P-47 in general, Dukes from Dukes Model has done a great expanded series on his P-47 build using that famous dark and light blue colors. I highly recommend his channel because he finds that great balance on showing you how to do something, but then also explaining to you why he does it. So definitely check him out and give him a sub. I'm also hoping that Mini Art releases the P-47Ms next year and gives me a chance to do both the blue P-47 and that dark blue, almost black one as well. Like I said, they definitely picked a great aircraft to use for their first kit because you can paint 20 of these models and not do the same one twice. This paint scheme was also another great test of trusting the weathering process because when it was first finished, even with the invasion stripes on it, the paint looked really rough and I had to really fight the urge to go in and clean up the light gray streaking. And I was really worried that this kit was going to look amateurish in the end. Even after adding the decals to the kit, I still had the feeling that it looked very garish. Speaking of decals, Miniart chose to go with Cartograph for this kit, and that's probably the safest bet you can make as a manufacturer. Cartograph decals always go down nice, and you never really have any issues with them. For my process, I put down some Mr. Mark Softer first, and then came in with a Q-tip dampened with Mr. Mark Softer to roll the decal into place. Once the decal looks like it's down smoothly and there's no air pockets underneath and I'm happy with the placement, I then came in with a wet coat of Tamiya Extra Strong setting solution. I then let the decal dry over the next 24 hours and do not touch it to avoid ripping it or any damage. The next day, if the decal still hasn't looked like it's sunk fully into panel lines, I'll hit it with another coat of the Mr. Tamiya Extra Strong setting solution. Because I used lacquer paints for this model, I put the decals directly on the paint without a clear coat. The only time I use a clear coat is when I've used AK Real Colors as I find they don't react well to some setting solutions and the clear coat protects them. Another advantage I find to not using a clear coat on top of your paint is you'll notice that setting solution lays down very nicely and it doesn't bead up like it does on a clear coat. I believe that's what prevents silvering. My theory is if that setting solution has beaded up a little bit on a clear coat, you don't get that nice even layer of chemical and the decal goes directly on the paint. It's just a theory, but it seems to work so far. Once the decals had had time to dry, I then put down a few layers of flat clear coat and then painted the aluminum of the cockpit frame to get that nice shine. Then it was time to move on to the ordnance. And here's another area that Mini Art has done really well because they give you everything that the P-47 carried except for the eight inch rockets. You get the bazooka tubes, you get 250 pound bombs, 500 pounders, 1000 pounders, and even 2000 pounders in the kit. You also get several different styles of drop tanks and the main slipper tank that goes under the belly of the aircraft. Now, when it came to assembling the bazooka tubes, I found I got a much better fit when I cut off the locating tab of the male side of the tube. After the two halves were together, I just put a thin coat of sprue goo on the seam and then later sanded that down when it had time to dry. During the Normandy operations, there was an order that went out for fighter aircraft to hold onto their drop tanks if possible because with the high tempo operations, it, drop tanks were actually in shortage for a lot of the squadrons. In one of the reference photos I have of Hairless Joe, I noticed that the drop tank looked a little bit darker compared to the underside paint of the aircraft, and I thought maybe it was possible that this drop tank came out of another squadron that still had the olive drab and neutral gray P-47s. It might not be 100% accurate, but it does add a little bit more interest to the paint. I decided to add some more interest to the bombs as well by adding some dissolved putty in a stippling motion and then gently sanding it back with a thousand grit sponge. And this is just to replicate the cast look of bombs. 
While those were drying, I installed the landing gear on the jug. And this is one area that MiniArt did well, and the legs lock into place very solidly and look like they're aligned properly. MiniArt gives you two different versions of tires for their P47. One is weighted, and the other one is unweighted. And they do a good job, but the problem is trying to clean up that join line over a diamond tread. Those are the only things I would recommend replacing in this kit. The tail wheel drops nicely into the kit and then is just secured with some glue. Then it's time for a pin wash, which is made up of some oil paint and enamel thinners. And once that's had about 30 minutes to dry, I come in with a shop towel to wipe it away. And if it's not cleaning up all of the wash, I'll dampen it a little bit with enamel thinner. And the key word is damp. If it's soaking, it lifts everything up. If the cloth is just damp, it takes everything off at the highest level. And that's going to bring this kit to a close. So in closing, what do I think of the Mini Art Kit? Obviously there are new to building aircraft models and there's a few teething issues they need to sort out, but I would definitely build this kit again. Although it's not shake and bake, the detail level alone makes it worth it to me. And now having built the kit once, I know what areas to watch out for and would make a few little changes while building the kit. Is it the best P47 on the market right now? I'm going to say yes because it shows the date of the other two competitors on the market. And if this is how Mini Art is going to start out with their aircraft kits, I am generally excited to see where they go with them. I'm really hoping they come out with an M down the road, but any aircraft they release is going to be of a good quality. It's just those few little issues they need to sort out in the design phase. But having mostly been an armor company up until now, I'm going to let them have a little bit of a pass on that one. Do I recommend this kit to your average builder? Yeah, I do actually. That cowling fits really the biggest issue you're gonna have, and I hope the points I've made here helps you get them together. So once again, thank you to MiniArt for sending me this kit. I actually did enjoy the build, and I wish them all the success with this product, because honestly, I would probably build a few more of these kits because I love the Thunderbolt. Maybe I'm biased. This is the Model Guy, and I'll see you next time.